Ben Woodruff here with another falconry video. Today's video we're going to be talking about uh, uh, techniques to help you find prairie falcon nests. Now uh, this video is kind of a mix of uh, old photos, newer photos, videos. Uh, it's pieced together but there's very good information. Now this is helpful if you're a falconer, if you're a biologist doing a biological survey, or if you're a bird bander, or even in some instances for a wildlife rehabilitator. So I hope these techniques are useful to you. Prairie falcons are, are a very interesting species. In falconry, they're kind of scrappy, they're tough, they're, they're strong-willed and not as easy to train as a peregrine, but they are very often used in the sport. And I've got other videos that introduce the species in falconry, but this is about finding their nests. Now, prairie falcons are a North American species. They range from Canada all throughout the western United States and all the way down into Mexico. In fact, their scientific name is Falco Mexicanus. Now, I live in Utah, and the experience I'll be sharing is mostly centered on experience with nesting prairie falcons in Utah, Nevada, Idaho, and Colorado. These techniques apply everywhere, but anywhere you go, a bird can nest wherever it feels like. My point in sharing this is to say, if you have no idea what you're doing, where can you actually find them based off of some techniques and help? That's what I'm trying to do. Now, prairie falcons hunt a wide range of food. They are mostly bird hunters, but they're happy to hunt rodents as well, especially in the deserts. A lot of times you will have a boom year where there's an explosion of ground squirrels or an explosion of kangaroo rats or voles, and they're like, sure, I'll, I'll eat those. But the bird that they are most interested in here in the West is the horned lark. That and the western meadowlark, these are two that when I've ever been in a prairie falcon nest, the remains of food that I see are mostly feathers from these two species, horned larks and western meadowlarks. So, it's a good, good thing to remember of where do you look for them? For prairie falcons, well, you look for where the horned larks are. Prairie falcons don't build an actual nest. Falcons don't do that. There's no assemblage of sticks. So then normally we always say falcons nest on a ledge. They'll find a ledge on a cliff and lay their eggs. Might scrape the dirt around a little bit, but that's it. Even though it's true they don't build a nest, that doesn't mean you're not looking for a stick nest. And I'll, I'll tell you where, wh what that means here in a few minutes. But there are many places to look. I, I've seen them on tops of mountains, I've seen them in, in ridiculous locations, but I want to show you where you can find a proliferation of prairie falcons. If you're in the West, what situations, what scenarios line up to make the highest density of prairie falcons if you're looking for them as a beginner? So first I'm going to go over where to look, and then I'm going to go into greater depth of what to look for once you know where you should be looking. So you need to be able to read the land. When you're going to the desert, you might just think, ah, there's just different plants everywhere. But if you're looking at a slope in the high deserts of the American West, there's pinyon pine trees. And those are the same ones where we get pine nuts from. And as you go further down, you get into juniper tree country and eventually into sagebrush. And then finally, you get into where you're having the ephedra plant, the Mormon tea plant, which doesn't have leaves. The, it's like green sticks that photosynthesize through the branches themselves. And then eventually you get to pickleweed, greasewood, and short grasses. And eventually, you end up with dry lakes and salt flats where nothing can grow. It's that transition from salt flats and dry lakes to sagebrush. That area is where you want to look. You want to look for cliffs and rock outcrops in those regions. 
because they're hunting larks, uh, if, if you're in denser trees, a lark could easily just hide. But those areas with the extremely short sh scrubby plants are filled with tiny insects, which the larks eat, and they're, the places for a lark to hide are not very good. So if you're a prairie falcon, a pr remember a prairie falcon is a bird built for speed and momentum. They want to build as much speed as they can, charge in, and knock their prey out of the sky, or even on the ground. They want to build up speed. They're not about uh, up and down dodging and darting like an occipiter. They want open space with short brush that they can flush and catch their prey out of. So, so remember that. From the salt flats and the dry lakes, through the short grasses, barely into the sage region. So once you're in the right territory, in, your, in the short grass country where it's really desolate and you're starting to look for rock outcrops and cliff faces, these don't have to be huge. <laughs> in fact, as a matter of fact, in Utah in the north, over half of the prairie falcon nests I've ever seen have literally been walk-ins, we call them, where a person can just step, 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 and you're right in just as you can see in this clip. Now this nest, this particular nest is inactive right now, but we wanted you to see just how ridiculously low and accessible potentially to predators the, the, some of these nests are. Some of them are on towering cliffs like you would expect for a peregrine falcon, but a lot of them are not. Don't discount extremely short, stubby little tiny cliff faces. They can have nests as well. When you're going around these cliff faces, Keep an eye out for snakes. This is the perfect environment for gopher snakes and great basin rattlesnake. Both of these species we find in great numbers. And if you're scrambling around cliffs, you may accidentally put your hand on one. So you have to be vigilant and hyper aware for any movement and anything that could represent a snake. Otherwise, you could get yourself bit and that's certainly not good. Now there's two things that you want to look for when you are in the right territory and you're starting to okay i i found the right plants i found you know short i'm finding a lot of uh, horned larks i think i'm in a good spot i'm starting to find cliffs which cliffs do i look for a lot of times it will be the most prominent cliff in the area as, as silly as that sounds what cliff looks like you would expect a falcon nest to be on will very likely have a prairie nest but here's specifics to look for hawk chalk and ravens. So start off with hawk chalk. Hawk chalk is the poop, the droppings from falcons that are roosting on a cliff or nesting right beneath their nest. They will leave lots of droppings. So get out uh, a good spotting scope, a telephoto lens, even, even a telescope as you're trying to scope out these different areas. Even a good pair of binoculars, check out and see along cliffs where are you noticing big patches of droppings. That doesn't mean they are from a falcon, but in the American West, normally we find droppings in big quantities from prairie falcons, ravens, and owls to really have a similar taste in nest sites. And in fact, they'll go back and forth. Ravens, falcons, and owls will all go back and forth on which particular cliff face or which particular ledge they want to nest in. So you, this goes back and forth. You could have a raven in ledge one year, then a prairie falcon in that same spot for three years, and then a great horned owl for a year, and then nothing for five years, and then a prairie falcon again. So. If you see a quantity of droppings, regardless of which of those three birds it probably is, any of those indicate a good cliff face to approach and try to look at it a little more closely. Now, raven nests. Ravens do build a stick nest. Remember, owls do not and falcons do not, but prairie, but ravens do build a very beautifully constructed, intricate nest out of thick sticks. And a prairie falcon would love one of these nests. So here's an example of a prairie falcon nest. That This is this is a uh, cliff face that has been used for years and years. In fact, I know from other falconers, prairie falcons have been returning to this site for generations. Uh, just so you get a sense of the size compared to a person, we have somebody walking in even though this is an inactive nest site at the moment. But if you look, then inside, here's a photo from a previous year. 
this was a ra it was a raven nest. Prairie falcons took it over and they just kind of smushed it down. They didn't add anything to it. And very often, year after year, they will raise young at this nest site. And it is just an old abandoned raven nest. A prairie falcon nest does not have to be in a very nice ledge. It certainly doesn't have to be in an abandoned raven nest. Here is a nest that is used year after year that is a tiny hole. You can see the female uh, as she is uh, sitting on the eggs and she can barely fit in this nest. It's incredibly small and here is a photo from previous years. You can see that the babies fill the entire nest. There's no room. The irony is right next to the site, no more than five to eight feet away, there is a big, beautiful, abandoned raven nest that these prairies could use. But instead, they choose this very specific northward facing slope that doesn't get a lot of sunlight in this tiny little opening on the side of a cliff. Now, of course, sometimes an overhang provides a good choice, which this is a difficult nest to find. As you saw from the previous one, the opening of a, of a nest cavity could be quite small. How much harder is it to find it if it's under an overhang? So here is a nest site of a prairie falcon that's a little tricky to get into. It's under an overhang and the only indication you have about it is the hawk chalk, the droppings beneath it. Now ravens underneath this overhang have built a nest that goes from one side of the overhang to the other. So in truth, it's a, it's a tunnel nest. It's like their own perfect cave that has two openings. Ravens have used this, prairie falcons have used this, and great horned owls have used this. They just rotate through this over and over again. But again, on this nest site, the key in finding it was seeing the droppings and then approaching closer to get a better visual of if anything was using it and whether or not it was prairie falcons. Now, if your time of year is correct, which you need to talk to your sponsor or falconers in your area to know what time of year prairie falcons nest in your area, but if you've timed things correctly and if you've gone to the right, uh, the right landscape, you found your horned larks, you found your short grass, you found a cliff face, you have found multiple cliffs with droppings, you found some raven nests and you approach, when you get close, the prairie falcons will let you know that the nest is there. They'll scream at you, they'll dive bomb you. Uh, some nests are particularly aggressive where they will occasionally even strike you, hit you in the head with their talons. So it is good to be careful. Prairie falcons normally don't hit people, but it most certainly does happen. So screaming falcons is, a, of course, the ultimate indicator that you have found the nest. Now, I must make a caution that with the laws in place here in the United States, it is illegal to bother or harass a nest for any reason, unless you have a legal permitting that allows it. So in other words, the government wants to make sure that people aren't, aren't, aren't out there just disrupting or bothering birds in a way. Now, prairie falcons actually can put up with a high level of, of human involvement, human trafficking. In fact, uh, there's a site I was out at uh, about a month ago called White Rocks, Utah. This place is always overrun with people. They, uh, we have ATVers, rock climbers. There's even people who make uh, little, little, um, miniature versions of rock crawlers and make a rock remote control rock crawler track, drive it all over. There's scout groups all the time climbing to the top of this. It is a busy, bustling place. And yet there is an active pair of prairie falcons there this year right now. So prairie falcons can put up with a fair amount, but legally and ethically, you do not want to bother any nesting bird of any kind more than is needful. So if you have a legal reason and a permitted reason to enter or approach closely a prairie falcon nest, maybe you're a falconer with a, with a permit or a bird bander or you're a biologist doing a survey, for any of these reasons, remember, bring proper equipment. If you are going to climb into a nest, it's best to use with ropes and harnesses. You should not go alone. You should have somebody there with you in case there is an accident. You fall, you can't move. Somebody else can get you to safety or make a call for you. And remember to bring water. Uh, I've many times in my early years not brought enough water and it's easy to uh, get heat stroke out there with these really harsh uh, cliff faces in the desert where the sun is just beating off of you and it's, it's very important to make sure of that. Now, something that I haven't heard addressed before that is extremely important is 
If you were to pull a baby for any reason, again, whether you're a biologist or whether you're a falconer or whatever the reason may be, typically baby prairie falcons are covered with blood mites, little parasitic external parasites that you'll see, and that it's kind of like a tick, and they are sucking blood out of these poor baby prairie falcons. And in addition to that, they may also have maggots, baby flies, fly larvae, in their ears, in their ear openings. Now this is gross to mention, but it's important that you are prepared so that you can help them. If you are bringing a baby, there, the, the, here, let me tell you where they come from. First of all, the blood mites are on rodents, y young rabbits that a prairie falcon might get, ground squirrels, kangaroo rats, any of these are often riddled with blood mites. So a mother or a father bring that back to the nest, the babies start eating it, but now the blood mites are still alive and they're like, well, I, the animal I'm on is cooling. They go to the next warm thing, which is the baby. Then they hatch, they get all over them. If you take them home, uh, don't use mite spray, use tweezers. Uh, a baby falcon is still growing. Its skin is absorbing so many things. It's not a very protective skin yet because they're growing by leaps and bounds every day. And if you're spraying them with a mite spray like you would use on poultry, it can cause damage. And it also sticks to their growing feather follicles. Not good. So instead, it's tedious, but take tweezers and don't squeeze them. What you do, it's, it's gross, but pinch with tweezers the back and gently pull and they'll come off and then give them a little squish with the tweezers and wipe that off on a paper towel. Then go to the next one. It's disgusting, but it's important that you understand this and you address it. Now, the reason why maggots can happen, and this can be true with any nesting birds of prey, but especially desert species, uh, the scent in the nest of dead animals that are brought and consumed attracts flies. Flies try to lay their uh, eggs and they're walking around on whatever's being eaten. And in the process, they're like, oh, and they will lay eggs at the ear opening of these poor baby prairie falcons. And when they hatch, the baby fly maggots crawl inside. This is a very easy fix. As gross as it sounds, it's a very easy fix. If you're at home with a prairie falcon, carefully and gently take olive oil in a dropper and draw and put it in their ears. This won't hurt their ears at all. And the the maggots go, ah, what's going on? We can't breathe. And they then they and they exit. And you're there with tweezers and you get them out. And you might have to do that uh, on a very bad situation two or three or four times. On a good situation, maybe only once. Or maybe you're lucky and they don't have them at all. But be prepared for those two things because they need to be addressed very early on so that your bird doesn't get them all over. So I hope that these techniques prove very valuable and helpful for you if you're looking for prairie falcon nests. Again, I acknowledge that prairie falcons are free-spirited birds that can nest wherever they feel like. But... I'm trying to arm you with knowledge that will help you get into areas that consistently have prairie falcon nests in predictable ways. Uh, feel free to check out the rest of my YouTube videos and hit subscribe if you like my channel. And let me know down below what other videos you would like to see. In the coming months, I'm going to film a lot more and produce a lot more. And as always, happy hawking.